Well, good morning. Um, this week we're going to do what normally is called a tabletop discussion, but we don't have a table here, so I don't know if we can call it that this morning. But we're going to have a discussion um, on practically applying the truths that Chris has been preaching on for the last couple weeks. So three weeks ago he spoke on um, the reality of temptation and the reality of the attacks by the enemy and how the enemy works to deceive us um, with temptations. And then the second week he talked about uh, understanding who we are in Christ and the power that that gives us and how that enables us to live in victory. And then last week he talked about emphasize on spiritual warfare and talked about how we can prepare ourselves for that. So this morning we're going to talk about practically applying the truths that we've been hearing um, to our lives. And I just want to say this. I, I was, I don't know if it was laid on my heart when we were singing right there, but I, re- I believe that this morning that God wants to set somebody free in this room from things that you're dealing with. I believe that there are people here, and I'm, I'm going to be very just transparent, I believe there's people in this room that deal with things that are beating you spiritually every day, and God wants you to have victory. And this morning, you're going to hear how to live in victory. And I'm praying that by the power of the Spirit that you will submit to what God is going to try to do in your heart if you are that person. As we've talked about spiritual warfare, um, it, can't, it, it makes me think about how um, I've been involved in real warfare in, in, in real life as a military member and how we have done some of our preparation for the different missions that I've been involved in. So normally, um, that as you get ready for a mission, you'll come into a brief and there'll be this PowerPoint. Um, and if you ever wanted to ruin the United States military, just take PowerPoint away from them. We wouldn't be able to function. I know Taylor would agree with that, right? But we've, we would go into this this briefing uh, with all these slides, and it would start with uh, an understanding of the area of operation from big picture to small picture, and then you would, um, at some point in there, you would be given this mission statement, and it would be directed from higher down to you, and you, as a unit, getting ready to go execute that mission, you don't get to really have a say in what you're being told to do, you're being told to do it by higher. You've been commissioned to go do um, this mission that they've passed down to you. And then you would get some of the commander, your direct commander's intent and key tasks of how he, he's foreseeing that we're going to go accomplish this mission. And then also in that brief, we would be getting intelligence reporting on <clears throat> what the enemy's most likely or most uh, possible course of action, and then also maybe what their most deadly course of action. And what that would be is like if we were doing a patrol from point A to point B, they would say, hey, along the route, histor- history, intelligence over history has pro- uh, produced these reports that says, hey, this is probably where we would get attacked. And this is from his, historical intelligence. This is the most likely way that we will get attacked. And then within that, hey, here's the most deadly way that we get attacked. So perhaps it would just be the most likely attack by the enemy would be an occasional roadside bomb. But due to the number of fighters in the area, the most deadly course of action the enemy will take will combine a roadside bomb with a coordinated attack from enemy fighting positions with all kinds of weaponry. And that potentially is a worst case scenario. So if you're in that brief and you hear that and you see those slides, it heightens you to that section of the route that you'll be traveling on or that village that you'll be going by. And it will get you ready, mentally prepare you because you understand based off of his- history what could potentially happen. And so if we apply those things to our spiritual life and the spiritual war that's going on, we've been given a mission. And that mission as Christians is to go into the world and preach the gospel, to be ministers of reconciliation, to be baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, to be teaching them to obey all that has been commanded to you as you've been discipled yourself. And we've also been shown in Scripture how the enemy operates historically all the way back to the garden and how the enemy is operating today and how the enemy will continue to operate until all things are made new. And the way that the enemy operates, has always operated, is by deception. So this morning, as we look at how do we practically apply these truths on spiritual warfare, we're going to start with talking about the reality of deception and what that looks like in our world. So Chris, if you would, from a big picture perspective, what does deception look like in today's world? Maybe. It's on. All right, the first thing we need to see is that um, deception is the tool of the enemy. In Genesis chapter 3, the first time we see Adam and Eve eat the fruit, and they were deceived, uh, 
Lucifer came as a serpent and spoke with Eve, and, uh, but he couldn't make her do anything, but she was deceived. Uh, in Genesis, we see he's called the, the father of lies. Satan is called the father of lies. And then in John 8, we're told that he's the great deceiver. So that is his method, his modus operandi all the time. That's what he's going to use every single time. Is, it's always decep- deception. Um, his motive is murder, and his method is deception. And so we need, to, um, we need to understand that. But it's interesting that all lies have some truth in them. Because if they didn't have any truth in them, nobody would believe them. But the best lies, the mo- most manip- uh, mo- manipulated, <laughs> that's what I was going for, the most manipulated lies have more truth in them. In fact, they'll have more truth in them than lies. And th- so it's really easy to fall for them. And I want to give you some big ones um, from a big grand scheme that we see happen all the time. We're seeing it in our, in our culture. We see it in our schools. We see it in everywhere. So I'm just going to give you a couple of them here. Um, relativism. That is that truth is always changing. That truth is relative to your situation. So if you're starving and you steal, then that's, not, then that's okay. But wait a second. If the Bible says thou shalt not steal, it's wrong. It's sin. And we can't justify our actions. But that's one of the big deceit uh, items that Satan uses is relativism. That let me relate this to my situation, and in my situation, it's okay. It's okay for me to divorce my wife because you just don't understand how hard she is to live with, or you don't understand what I've been through or what I'm going through. I want to give you a verse that it just um, has been pounding me. It's First Peter four nineteen. It says, "So then, those who suffer according to uh, according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good." And that doesn't give us any excuse. Even if you're suffering, you continue to do what's right because of what's right to do. The second one I want you to see is subjectivism. That is that there's, there's your truth and there's my truth and there's his truth. And the, wait a second. Truth is not this, this moving target. Jesus is truth. The Bible says Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. And then he said, thy word is truth. This word is truth. So if it disagrees with this, I don't care what kind of situation you're in. It's not true. Okay, so we need to make sure that we understand these ways that they're coming in. The, uh, another way that we're seeing in secular humanism that's creeping in all over the place, even inside the church, is existentialism, which basically means I get to decide what's right and what's wrong. I get to decide what's moral and what's immoral. I get to decide all of that stuff. And I want you to understand that that's a huge, big picture deception um, place. And then, uh, then the last one is rationalism. That only what I can understand is what's, uh, is what's true. And, uh, and all of these ways are deception to try to get us off following Christ. The goal, again, the, his, his, motive, or his motive is to murder you, and his method is deceit. And so we have to be careful with all of those things. So Chris talked about big overarching um, you know, themes with deception that we're seeing in our culture. In your own personal life, how do you see deception creeping in every day throughout the day? Yeah, so one of the things, Chris kind of touched on it, pointed towards it. To me, what I see, especially in our culture, and I fight with this in my personal life, is this deceitful lie that w- I am the center of the you know, like I am what is most important. Um, part of this I'll trace, i just point it out right now, is in television and movies, uh, on YouTube, Instagram, all of these things are technology that's a medium where you have one person that's kind of the center of attention. Um, you got a movie, you got a protagonist, uh, and we all want to be the protagonist of our own movie, right? But in the real world, in the world that we live in, the protagonist is Christ. It is not us. That doesn't mean that we're not important, but it does put us in perspective. And when the lie that I see that happens in my life is, oh, I deserve better, or I should have this. I'm a good guy. I shouldn't have to deal with this. Do you see the little lie that's coming in there? And then it's pride uh, kind of flavored with uh, American independence and like self-assertion and stuff. I have rights, um, but that's not a biblical perspective of what's going on. And so one of the scriptures that I think is really important, and we've kind of talked about, I think Chris talked about this uh, as he was preaching through uh, spiritual warfare last week, but it's from 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. And uh, Paul writes, he says, for though we live in the body, we do not wage war in an unspiritual way. 
Implication, it's a spiritual way that we wage war. Since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. And, and one of the metaphors or the ideas that we've talked about is we've talked about uh, spiritual warfare is this idea of Satan trying to build strongholds in your life. And I think one of the ways he lays that foundation is kind of getting into you and this little lie that says, hey, you're most important. Uh, the church that I grew up in, a pastor that I was underneath all the way up in my teen years, um, they found out that he had been having an, uh, at least an emotional affair, if not a physical affair, with uh, a, another lady other than his wife. And one of the things that he kind of said a, a, to the elders as they were working through with him was, and it was part of it was rooted in he was having some marriage problems and he wasn't seeking counsel and seeking help outside of his marriage, um, was I deserve a better marriage. I deserve a better wife. And so he had bought into the lie that he just deserved better. And to me, that's I always seems as a cautionary tale, tale to me is, uh, don't buy that lie. Don't buy into that because it'll, it's, it's a place where Satan will build a stronghold that will wreck your life. Mm -hmm. those, those strongholds always come in areas where, um, where we're vulnerable. And sometimes that changes over time. Uh, right now, one of the areas that I struggle with is insecurity. And I've always been a secure person, always had, you know, always felt confident to stand up or whatever. And, but those insecurities come when I became a senior pastor. It was like those things just overwhelm you because people come and go and they leave and you feel like it's always your fault and and so satan's just pointing at you all the time saying you're the one that did this you did this and and i have to be reminded all the time wait a second who am i i am who god says i am and yes that's how satan works he want he he starts out in amongst us in our homes and in our families and then he gets he throws those little darts that that kind of flame up and then somebody has this feeling like well pastor josh i drove past him the other day and he didn't even wave at me didn't even look at me he must not like me and then they get upset and they dwell on it and they festers for a long time and then all of a sudden it blows up and it comes out that they're leaving the church because of this or this when that wasn't really the reason but that was that's kind of how it came out and then all of a sudden or because pastor chris did this and then all of a sudden i feel like God, why did, I, why did I do that? And then you start second-guessing everything you do. And now all of a sudden he's got this person fooled and he's, he's lying to this person that they bought into. He's lying to me that I bought into. And now he's starting to win the war. It always starts in those little battles. And so like, it's critical that we, that we stand up against those things and, and ask ourselves those questions. I, was, I told the first um, group that we had that one of the things that I'm so thankful for is a wife that knows me so well and always is constantly reminding me, you know, well, is that really true? And she says, what, what's, what's your verse? You know, whatever's true, whatever thing's lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any praise, think on these things. Because my mind runs to the negative side all the time. And it's imperative that we replace those things with the positive thoughts. I, know, I was dealing with some things yesterday, just buzzing around, trying to take advantage of the day that, to get things um, starting to get packed up and don't go into the dump. Uh, dropping things off, and I'd started to have some thoughts about some different people, it, like brothers and sisters in Christ, and like, well, they probably think this way, or they probably feel this way, or this or that, and and I re recognize, like, gosh, like, I don't know what they think, I don't know what they feel, I got to be really careful, because my mind is maybe being deceived about, and probably is being deceived, to cause discord and division, and that's one of the things that, um, you know, I, I've learned working here over the last couple of years with Chris, talking about how does I he... cause division in business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to say it, but you brought it up. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but that how does the enemy work? He, dece like, he deceives to divide. That's what he does. He deceives to divide you in, by causing you to, encouraging you, deceiving you to do things that divide you from fellowship with God, from fellowship with each other, cause discord and division in a church to break it in half, if he can divide it and weaken it, right? Man, there's, I don't think there's anything stronger on the planet than a room full of Christians that are all sold out and living for the Lord and ready to do whatever he's called them to do through the power of the Spirit. And how does the enemy want to disrupt that? Deceive to divide. Um, I was um, w talking to a counselor recently, and he told me, he gave me this acronym, HALT B, H-A-L-T-B. And he said in his experience over the years, he says men fail when they're 
in one of those areas, when one or more of those areas or things are happening to them, when they're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or bored. And he says, just like in, in real life as in a combat mission, knowing where you're susceptible, all right, hey, when we go through this part of the valley and take this really sharp turn, that's where the enemy might hit us. For us, we need to be sensitive, asking God daily, Father, help me to be sensitive to your spirit that I'm aware of the times when I am most susceptible to being deceived. And comes when, for men, listen men, it's when you're hang, hangry. I did that in the <laughs> first service too. I didn't mean to do that. Hangry, hungry and angry, lonely, tired, or bored. That's when we are most susceptible to being deceived to end up um, acting on that deception, whether it be in our thought process or physically. It's interesting to me that we're seeing, especially during COVID, we're seeing so many suicides on the rise and so many things, so many things that are associated with that because people are bored. They're stuck in their house and weren't able to do anything. So like, it's critical that we understand kind of where we are susceptible because all of us, we know where we're susceptible. I know where things are going to come. And so I have to, you know, Make sure that I'm aware as I'm as I'm dealing with that situation that I'm that I'm not putting myself in a situation to fall. One of the, we're going to talk about it in a little bit about how uh, with confession when we fail. But I think it's important, especially couples or if you have someone who you live with. I think being honest with each other. I know one of the things that has helped Beck and I is being honest with each other about when we are susceptible, and then asking like she might ask me, "Hey, or do you need to eat something?" You know, <laughs> like, and it's like, yeah, shoot, I didn't even like, I've been going hard all day trying to get stuff done. And then you eat something and it's like 10 minutes later, I'm like a different person. It's like, that's all it took, you know, <laughs> but, but just like confession has power when we fail, support accountability has power. And that's all it is, is accountable. Hey, yeah. start to act like a knucklehead. Is there something you can do to stop being a knucklehead? You're giving into temptation, you know, oh shoot. Yeah. I'm just hungry or I'm tired. I've been going hard all day. But have, being open with each other, transparency is huge, so that we can support each other. Yeah. I know, and y'all kind of touched on it. For me, so I'm a talker and a thinker, like, and I, sometimes I'll overthink things. And what I've noticed in my life is I will, <laughs> you ever notice that I like to think? Okay, yeah. No. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Snuck that in up. But the, that manifests in my life in other ways um, that sometimes aren't as healthy. So, um, I have a, a wonderful wife, and we homes, homeschool three kids. So by the time I'm done here working on stuff at the church, and I might have had a long day, I got a long to-do list, and I'm just cranking out, getting it done, and I'm I'm tired when I get home. But guarantee you, she, and like it, it'll be a day where I, I probably woke her up coughing in the middle or in the night or whatever. She had very little sleep, and then she had to homeschool our three boys, which are awesome. But sometimes boys get loud, and so she's got a headache. She's tired. I get home. And I know, like, she's already told me, like, I didn't sleep much last night, I'm tired. So I, when I'm coming home, I need to know in my brain that she's probably not going to be the most talkative. <laughs> she doesn't probably want to have a long conversation. And sometimes um, it, what she needs is time by herself to recharge. And so when I come home and, and, and we have dinner and she's like, I just need some time by myself. I'm going to go back to the bedroom. And so I, I, I stay out and I, I play with our boys and do stuff with them. And it's kind of like tag your it. But there's a little lie that can sneak in there that Satan tries to throw at me frequently is, hey, she kind of gave you the cold shoulder. Like, she doesn't appreciate you. Like, I don't know if she loves you anymore. Uh, and if I don't stop myself, do you see that spiral? Like, and it's all lies. And it's Satan or spiritual, like, or just my sinful nature trying to sneak in and build a stronghold and, and shoot arrows against my marriage. And if I don't stop myself, that spiral can go on for 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, my mind is in another place that it doesn't need to be. And that's when I have to stop and say, God, this is not, this is not where, the way I need to be thinking about my wife. This is not the way I need to be thinking about my marriage. And Father, I confess this and help me. Help me get my heart right. Help me to love her and serve her right. Help me to love and serve my boys right. And so turn my attention. But that spiral, to me, that, that's one of the ways that Satan kind of works in my life. In any given situation, he'll try to toss some little things out there to see if I snag onto them. And then I, I'll have to catch myself. It's interesting because when I do counseling, it's usually after years and years of this stuff that builds up, that builds up, that builds up, that was never resolved. And had it been resolved at the early stages, you know, it's become a stronghold. And, and all of a sudden, this marriage is on the brink of destruction because, and they, because they haven't dealt with these 
things early in it. And if we would deal with the things early in them, then uh, it would prevent a whole lot of, a whole lot of suffering in that. So as deception happens, right? Because every single person in this, in this room, there's no one in here that's an exception. The enemy, if you are a follower of Christ, the enemy is a- adamantly working against you to deceive you. So I'm, I'm not speaking some foreign language that you don't understand right now. At least I hope not. The reality is it's happening in your life. And, and it's happening in a multitude of ways in this room in our lives. We're tempted. Um, James talks about that when we're drawn away by the lust of the, that we have for something. Everybody in here has sin that easily ensnares you, right? And it could be the mundane of being grumpy when you're hungry, or it could be lust, it could be pride, it could be jealousy, it could be... Name the, name the list, right? But when we come to those moments when we recognize that we're being, I'm being deceived in this moment, how do I handle that so that I can live victoriously and then not have to come see you in years after this stronghold's been built in my life? It's, it's almost too simple. It's confess it and renounce it. Um, unconfessed sin will never draw us closer to Christ. It'll never draw us closer to the person that we've, uh, that we've sinned against. But when we confess it and renounce it, the Bible tells us in uh, Psalm, or Proverbs 18, whoever conceals his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces his sin will find mercy. And I think about that all the time, but like confessing my sin, I don't want to confess my sin. I shared with you guys a couple months about, ago about I blew up in the McDonald's drive through because I thought I gave the lady a 20 and I found out I only gave her a 10. I did not want to go over there and apologize. I did not, I thought, I, mean, I could have blew that off like it's no big deal. I mean, they don't know who I am, whatever. But I knew if I leave that in my heart, it's going to sow a seed and, and I'm allowing a foothold in my life. So what I do, I have to go over there, ask the manager to speak with him and speak to the lady and then apologize to him. I did not want to do it. I, it was miserable to me. But if I didn't do it, it would be, it would be terrible We've talked about the, uh, the verses, the sun, let, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. How many times do you go to bed angry with your wife or angry with your husband because you didn't deal with something that was festering there and all of a sudden you've allowed this foothold into your life that is digging deeper, it's creating a stronghold. He's building the foundation to build this big fort right in the right to divide you and your wife. And so don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So deal with it. And we deal with it by confessing and renouncing uh, I don't know of a I don't know of a simpler way to put it, but it sounds really simple. It's not because those lies will really come clean. You know how much of an idiot you're going to look like when you walk into McDonald's and all those people are going to be there, and then you're going to have to you're going to apologize in front of all of them, and you th- and then you, it doesn't really matter. It, that's not a big deal, and that's just an example. But how many examples are there in our homes? I, Zach will tell you I apologize to him and Matt all the time because as a parent, I made a lot of mistakes. If I didn't apologize to them, they would think that that's okay. And it's not okay. So I think confessing and renouncing is, uh, and repenting. You know, I, repenting is I'm walking this way. This is what I was doing. Now I turn around and I'm walking the other way because I need, because as a Christian, I'm called to walk by faith. And either, uh, to, the Bible says, to whom you yield yourself, servants to obey, to him whose servant you are, whether to sin unto death or to Christ unto righteousness. So when I realize that, hey, what I just did was sin, I need to confess it and renounce it and turn around and walk the other way and yield myself to Christ. That is what walking by faith looks like. It is very practical. When the Bible says, uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and I turn and I go, whoa, that wasn't lovely what I did to her there. And I apologize and confess it and renounce it. I turn around and I'm walking the other way. So the way that the Spirit brings to light sin, right, is when we fail. So we're deceived. We realize, okay, I did something wrong because the Spirit will remind us of what God's Word says, right? The the Word says don't do this or do this, and you did the opposite, and the Spirit's like, hey, that was sin. And then we're faced with this moment, okay, I need to confess and repent it. What, what about before we sin, right? So I, I realize, because I've hidden the word in my heart, as we've talked about me, um, memorizing and meditating on Scripture, so I'm prior to acting on this deception, 
how do I handle, like, how can I live in victory when I realize, like, okay, based off of what God's word says, this thought is leading me to do something that I shouldn't do. How do I live victoriously in that moment? Yeah, so one of the things that I think is really good is when you are familiar with the truth, it's kind of kind of like with music, if someone s sings off key, like they're singing a song you know, okay, uh, there's going to be a NASCAR race later today, and they will sing the, na the national anthem before it. And NASCAR is interesting because every week they have someone different singing the national anthem, and like some people, it's like, oh, that was awesome. Another one's like, you were so close. Um, <laughs> but It's NASCAR. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. No, but in any, any sports, they're going to sing the national anthem beforehand. And how many times have you heard one and you're like, That's a, that, that was creative. I don't know. If it. <laughs> but you, those moments when you know how it's supposed to sound and you know when someone's doing it good, like you're like, oh, they, they nailed it. That was awesome. Like, I hope I can hear them do that again. And um, other times it's like, bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> but what? The reason you can identify the, the performance that was less than ideal, as opposed to the one that just nailed it, is because you knew how the song goes. Does that make sense? And so when Chris ta said earlier that Jesus is truth, I don't think we understand how significant that statement is. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in our modern world, they'll talk about truth as either subjective, like you pointed to, or as objective. And when they say objective, they mean something that's out there, disembodied, depersonalized. And it's something that you kind of have to uncover, and then once you see it, you know it, and that's it. But when the Bible posits Christ, when Christ presents himself as a person, how do you get to know a person? A person is not a fact you acquire and then you store in your brain. A person is someone that you get to know in a relationship. Uh, say Chris and I go to a pastor's conference, and they, they have, you know, uh, a big setup, and so there's all these different booths, and so we're going to go off and go to different booths and kind of check out things that are in our interest, and, but we're going to meet up afterwards. Well, after I'm done looking around, I have to find Chris. How do I find Chris? Well, I know what he looks like. I also know how he walks and how he talks. He might not be wearing a blue shirt and black slacks. He might put a wig on just to try to fool me, but I will probably find him because I can recognize him. He and I have been working together for years. Okay, in your life, the time that you spend in the Word every day, the time that you spend in prayer, this is you learning to know Christ, to know God, to listen to the Holy Spirit. You want to know what the Holy Spirit sounds like? This is what the Holy Spirit sounds like. Amen. Um, and do you want to know how the Holy Spirit moves? You can see the, those movements here in the Word. And so how do we get to that place where we recognize the sin in our lives? Well, the, the first step, the primary step, is the simple ideal of reading your Bible and praying every day. So that in that moment when you're starting to have, for me, thoughts that are spiraling, that doesn't resonate with who, what I know that Christ has called me to be and what Christ has called my marriage to be. That song is out of tune. I need to get my heart tuned right. And so that's when I stop and when I pray. That's when knowing the word, the scriptures that are relevant to your strugg struggles. Okay, here's a really simple discipline. You're struggling with something in your life. You can go into Google. Uh, scriptures for blah, blah, blah. Whatever, whatever it is. And you will find 50 lists and you can just take the top two or three verses, start memorizing there. You will never regret memorizing a verse. Yeah. You know what? If you can find another verse that was better later on, it's okay. You memorize another one. You memorize that one. But starting with the word, and then that, that tunes your heart. And then when you get in the moment, you speak the verse. Uh, you speak the scripture. You speak the word. And then you start to pray. And your focus is no longer on the sin that would ensnare. But all of a sudden, your, your attention has been shifted. When James... Uh, four says, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's exactly what it's talking about is I'm, I am submitting to his word. I'm recognizing that what he said was sin is sin and that is taking part in my life. And so I'm submitting, I'm, I'm submitting myself to God saying, God, I'm, I know I recognize this is sin and I'm repenting from it. And it says, submit yourself to, therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That doesn't give me 
power over Satan. I don't have power over Satan. In fact, even in Jude, Michael, the archangel Michael said, the Lord rebuke you because he didn't have that authority. But what I have is victory. I ha he, Christ has already won the battle. And he said, I can claim these things and I can submit myself to the word of God and submit myself to his truth and then proclaim those to the enemy and, and win that battle. And you were going to talk about the, um, the, when Christ was being tempted. So one of the thoughts there is, I, I believe if we look at each one of those passages, submit, in Ephesians 6 it says, take up, um, captivate our thoughts. There is, we cannot be complacent, right? So go, go back to the real world combat situation. If the guys are riding in the truck and the guy that's, the gunners that are on top of the vehicle are not doing their job and they're just kind of lollygagging, listening to something on their you know, headphones or their helmets unbuckled, they're not even ready, right? They're just being complacent. They're just like, ah, somebody else will take care of it, right? That's not going to set that group up for success. It's purposeful. You have to be engaged, looking for the enemy, ready, ready, weapon ready to engage the enemy, ready to fight at the first sign of the enemy, not waiting to take a bunch of lumps, right, to get beat up and then be like, oh, okay, I guess I should start fighting. There's this purposeful action that we're supposed to be taking. And three steps um, I, in my life recently, really understanding these better and experiencing like true victory, the three steps are I need to be captivating every thought, every thought, not just, that's what scripture says in, in 2 Corinthians 10. It doesn't say some thoughts. It says every thought, not just the bad thoughts, every thought, because it's amazing. I think everybody in here could relate to this. Sometimes you'll be thinking about something and you'll be like, how in the world did I get to think about this? That's horrible. Like, how did my mind go there? And then you go back through the spider web and you're like, oh, it all started when I was thinking about my sister and when we were growing up. And, and now I'm thinking about something I shouldn't be thinking about because I didn't captivate my, I didn't captivate every thought. I waited until, it, and then and it got, just got deceived into this crazy spider web of thought. So we need to be captivating every thought. I need to be purposefully thinking about who I am in Christ, what Chris preached about two weeks ago, who I am. And then third, Ephesians 6 says that I'm supposed to be wielding the word of God, the, which is the speaking of the written word of God into situations. Having, a, um, having scripture memorized for the sins that easily ensnare me. Beck and I have memorized um, Psalms 91, which is 16 verses, and it just talks about that he is our refuge and our fortress, and it talks about God's protection. And what I find myself doing is when I start to have deception coming in my mind, I just start, we start quoting. In fact, I called or I texted Beck the other day. And I said, hey, please be praying for me. I'm being attacked right now. I was driving on the road. And she responded, Psalms 91. And I was like, oh, I just totally wasn't even thinking about that. So I started quoting and it was gone. That there's something about speaking the word of God into the situations because the enemy can't flee. And we, you know, we shared in the first service that if we look at how um, the enemy has worked in scripture in the garden of Eden. He didn't like Chris said earlier He, he didn't the enemy didn't take the apple and sh or whatever it was the fruit and shove it in Eve's mouth it, He's in, he's incapable of doing that But what he did was he deceived her into thinking that it was okay and profitable for her to eat the fruit And then you look throughout scripture That's the same way the enemy operated in the lives of the Israelites and then when the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the enemy I mean there's some physiological things going on in Jesus's body after 40 days of fasting in the desert and the enemy comes and three times offers him something deceptively and Jesus responds not with plain plain language hey don't forget about who I am I'm the son of God you can't be talking to me like that he says no nope. he says it is written and I believe Jesus did that as an example for us on how do we handle deception when it's brought into our lives simply saying it is written there shall not be or Scripture says do not do this or scripture says it's not profitable for a man to do this and we start speaking that in situations I, I share with the first service a couple months ago I was sitting in my garage and I was having these thought these condemning thoughts in my mind and I was sitting in my truck and I just started quoting scripture I captivated my thought I got oh, I want to be obedient to you and I started quoting scripture and like a couple moments later I got through the scripture I was quoting and my mind was completely blank like to the point where I was like I can't even remember what was bothering me. And I like started to try to recall it. And I'm like, gosh, no, don't bring that back. I just prayed to go to go away, <laughs> you know, but it's, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's not like, it's not some like diet fad. That's like you were promised to lose 20 pounds and it didn't work. And you're like, ah, I'm done with this. No, if you, if we fight the way God's word says to fight, you will experience victory. 
But the thing that you can't be is lazy about it. You have to be purposeful. You have to be taking up. You have to be standing firm. You have to be speaking the word of God. You have to be captivating your thoughts. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're not going to live in victory. And I, in the Old Testament, I don't know the reference, it says, be holy as I am holy. And then it's, re, it's brought up again in the New Testament. You've heard it's written, be holy as, as he is holy. Like, and I, for a long time in my life, it's like, gosh, like I'm supposed to be able to be holy. I have the spirit of God living in me. How, I don't feel like that's absolutely really possible. Well, and when something doesn't seem possible, we're less likely to chase after it, right? It's like running a marathon in two hours. That's impossible for me. So I'm not even going to run, right? You know what I'm saying? But if it was like, hey, you can run a marathon, you got 12 hours to do it, like, oh, okay, that's possible. I could do that, you know. I can't walk most of it. But, but when it's possible, when we know it's possible, we're more motivated to go after it. And I'm telling you, it is possible to live a holy lifestyle if we are being purposeful to fight and resist the way that the Bible teaches us to do that. Resistance is exactly, that's why he, I, I kind of hammered that last week with the Ephesians that he said, stand fast, stand firm. You know, all those action words that it has to be an active resistance. It's not this passive, well, I hope this doesn't come. It's a, it's a, um, and, and when we went through the spiritual armor, it was put on the spiritual armor and live in there. You know, that helmet of salvation, got, nothing can knock it off. Um, that breastplate of righteousness, I'm declared, I'm already that. God sees me as that, but I have to now live like that. And that is what discipleship's all about. This whole message series is about discipleship. And as a disciple of Christ, we need to understand that we are victorious, that Christ has already won the war, and all I have to do is start living out what he says. In fact, all those scriptures that say, you were once this, 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 but Christ says, you're no longer those things. Now you're here, here. Now you're more than a conqueror. You're, you know, all of those things. God has already won the victory, and all we need to do is start claiming it. We claim it by faith, little steps of faith, that I'm turning toward you, Lord, that I'm not going to do that, Lord, that I recognize that as sin, and I'm going to start turning from that, and all of those things, and, and pretty soon we're walking toward the Lord, and then we're receiving the spiritual blessings that God... Understand, again, at the beginning we talked about that Satan's goal is destruction, but Christ came that we can have life and have it more abundantly. I don't know about you, but I don't like destruction, but I like abundant life, and when I, when I live for Christ, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be easy, but... We are more than conquerors. And my prayer in this whole series is not that we'll be so afraid of Satan, but that we'll understand that we have the power to have victory. There's no, Hebrews 10, or I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there's no temptation that's overtaking you, but what is common to man. And God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted more than what you're able, but will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, there's no temptation that I'm ever going to face that I'm not able to either find a way out or I can bear it. And, I, and sometimes I think we're just so afraid to stand up and fight. And it's important that we stand up and fight and say, God, you're on my side. It's your victory. And trust in the Lord with all your heart. Yeah. So one of the scriptures, I was kind of going through some different scriptures on spiritual warfare. And one that popped out to me was Galatians 6, 9. It says, so we must not get tired of doing good. Amen. For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. And I, I love that second half because the first half speaks to me because I get tired. You know, you have a lot of stuff going on. I get tired. And when I'm tired, I'm less likely to do the good that God's called me to do. Um, there was a book that I read a few years ago, and I highly recommend it. It was one of the easiest books I've read. It, chapters were like three to five pages wrong. So like easy, small book. It's called God of the Mundane. And what it did is it turned my eyes from this kind of uh, big, uh, like, you know, big church, big idea, like big services, like all this like flashbang Christianity. And it was a guy kind of meditating on, uh, he, he, had, he was transitioning out of the ministry into working at a bank. And he was talking about seeing God at work every day in the mundane. And this is, this is where the struggle is, is in the mundane. The mundanity of, uh, mundanity of our lives, of our relationships, um, of our jobs, and even of serving. What's beautiful is when you start to recognize the, the voice of the Spirit, the movement of the Spirit by your time in the Word, you can begin to recognize God at work all around you. Yes, you'll start to recognize the, li the lies where Satan tries to attack you, but you also get to see the Spirit at work. And I think that tuning of our heart where we can begin to see God at work around us, 
You have coworkers. What's God's, what is God doing in their lives? What is God doing through you in their lives? What are the opportunities there? I, when you go to work, you, every day you have opportunities for conversations. What, which conversation is God going to use to do something special? And my, like one of my prayers when I was working in a warehouse was, God, help me to see where you're working so I can be a part of it. Had a kid who was taking a class on religion, was like, so what do you think about the, it's like they were talking about Paul in class, and they said that Paul preached a different Christianity than Christ. I was like, giddy up, boy. <laughs> like, that's, that's in the back. I was like, let's talk about this. Kid was not a Christian, but I got to talk with him about Paul and the gospel. Like, talk about a vehicle for giving the gospel to someone. Out of the blue, um, and so I, like as soon as he started to open his mouth, I was like, gospel opportunity. This is a gospel conversation. Uh, but not, never, and so this, we must not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time. And so I love this promise that says, you know, persevere, endure. I know you're tired, but you can still be loving to that coworker that drives you nuts. You can still serve your wife or your husband even though you're tired and exhausted, and you may be irritated with them, okay? Let's be honest. But you can still love and serve them uh, because, and I think this is, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. There's kind of a promise there. And it's in God's time. It's not in our time. But there's a blessing and a promise there that I think we can look forward to. So as we wrap this up here in a couple minutes, there are probably people in this room right now that are being convicted of sin that's in their life, of the battles that they've lost, the battles that they continue to lose, because they've been maybe not educated on the need to be purposefully standing firm and fighting, and because of maybe not being educated or an unwillingness to confess immediately when the Spirit reminds them or shows them that what they've been doing is sin, that there are strongholds in this room how, how, do we get, how do we get rid of them? And what, what's, what's the consequence of not dealing with these things in our lives? The first way is we need to know who we are. Because one of the lies that he's convinced so many people of is that you're not worth it anymore. You're no good. That living a defeated life, we have to remember and be reminded over and over again I'm not that person because Christ set me free and he declared me righteous, not because of any works that I've done, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved me. So understand who I am in Christ. The second thing, I have to live in righteousness. You see, it's not enough to turn away from sin. I need to turn away from sin and to something better because that uh, boredom is one of the things that you talked about. But I need to turn my life to something better. I remember when I first came down here and was a youth pastor, and Mary Hankins told me this. She said, Chris, you can't ask these kids to stop doing something unless you give them an alternative because they will find something to do. But we ought to be able to find things to do that are positive things. I, when I counsel uh, marriage couples, a lot of times they come in and I have them write down 10 things that they love about their spouse. Sometimes when they're at that end, la end stage, it's hard for them to write down one or two things. And then I encourage them to tell your partner how much you love, why you love them. I tell every one of those things for a week straight. And then you're going to report back to me and tell me how that went. Because it's really easy to just believe these lies. And so, you know, I talked about in one of the sermons about guardrails that we, if I'm going to, if I know that this is a place where I'm going to face temptation, then stop going there. If I know that every time I open my computer up that there's going to be a temptation to get on porn, turn it off, throw it out the window, get rid of it. Whatever you've got to do, you've got to do it. And, and I promise you that it is God's way to avoid, you know, avoid it, pass not by it, run from it. Look at all the people that were victorious in, in the Bible and Gideon, uh, his, uh, Potiphar's wife came after him. He got out of there, went to prison for it. He's got to be thinking, what in the world... But in the end, God raised them and elevated them. It's always about um, submitting myself to God. And I don't know, and sometimes I don't know what that's going to look like when I do it and when I confess and renounce it. But I promise you, it will always be the better answer. Yeah, so you've heard us use the word confession, and that, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But confession is one of the core components of Christianity. You see it in the Old Testament, 
in the sacrificial system, the priests would confess the sins of Israel. Um, and when people were bringing their sacrifices, they were supposed to confess their sins. Now, we, we don't sacrifice animals because Christ died on the cross for us. But we still need to practice that practice of confession. And it makes people uncomfortable, but the, the biblical way of learning, of getting to know what we need to know, is submission to the process that God has laid out. So one of the interesting stories that kind of fascinated me as I started looking at it in this light is in Genesis, when God gave Adam the task of naming the animals. Like when I was a kid, like it just kind of made sense. Like God made a bunch of animals. He made a guy. Like we need to name the animals so that kids can learn to spell their names like cat and bee. Like, you know, but that made sense, right? So God had him name them all. Um, but what's interesting is right out of Adam naming those animals is when God introduced Eve. And when Adam saw Eve, he recognized the hole in his life that she filled. He recognized that he needed a helper, but that no other creation, no other animal or creature in creation could uh, serve alongside him like Eve could. And so when he comes out of submitting himself to the process that God laid out, God's, God gave him a job, name the animals. He recognized he was able to see a blessing and receive a blessing because he followed the process that God had laid out. Now, confession is one of those processes that God has laid out for us as believers. And it is a process that shapes us and forms us in ways that I cannot exactly articulate for you. We can talk about some of the aspects of it. But there's a blessing that's waiting for you on the other side of submitting to the process that God has laid out. There's a blessing that you can't even imagine, okay? The way that that will function in your life, the way that will shape you and form you. And so that is my encouragement is that as we engage sin, as we fight throughout our week, we will have victories, we will have failures. But that aspect of, you know, identifying this sin, speaking scripture, praying, and then confessing. That's why for me, when I catch myself in a spiral, I identify it. Like I speak it out to God. This is what I'm thinking. This is wrong. I, before we turn it over to you to close, I, one of the things that I see is the other side of it. There's the person who's doing the confessing. And sometimes confession is so hard because it's so, un, it's so not received well sometimes. And we have to understand that there's two sides of it because Christ forgave me. And I'm to forgive as Christ forgave me. And I'm guilty. So, but sometimes somebody will come and, and they'll confess to me a sin. And, and I get upset and I get mad. Like, why did you do that? And it stops the process. And the process is two-sided. It's not only the person that's confessing, but as the church, we've all been forgiven for much worse. And so it's important and it's imperative that as a church, we understand the other side of, of confession. That people might come confess something to me and I'm called to love the person, not okay the sin, and not, not say, okay, go, go along, but to help them walk through it uh, because it's important. So when, as children of God, we belong to Him. We are His territory. And when we allow the enemy to cross the line into His territory and build strongholds in our lives, and they build, they build a fortress, and we can, we can go on and we can fill our lives with other things, but that, those fortresses that have been built on property that's not the enemy's, am I making sense? It's not the enemy's property. You as a child of, of God belong to him, and, and if I've allowed, you've allowed the enemy to come into your life, which is property of God, and build a stronghold, that stronghold has to be identified and it has to be taken care of. And the way that it's done is by acknowledging that. And the way that we acknowledge those strongholds is confession. There are, there are people in this room that need to go confess sin to somebody else. Husbands, maybe it's your wives. Wives, maybe it's your husbands. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a relative. Maybe it's just a struggle that you have that you just need. You need another Christian to know about because this is the picture. When you acknowledge, I am struggling and failing in this area, 
It's like you're walking up to the fortress that the enemy has built in your life, and you're saying, I see you, and I know why you're here, and you are no longer going to operate out of this property that's not yours. You have no right to hold this ground. But it only comes through confession. And if you're unwilling to confess those things, you do not love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. And I know from personal experience, when I've been unwilling to confess things in my life, I've been saying, God, I think I love you with most of my heart, mind, and soul, but this you can't have. And if you're saying but at the end of that sentence, then you, are, you do not love him with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul. And church, he is unwilling to settle for that. He is unwilling to not have all of you. And you're the only one that can walk up to that fortress and shout to the enemy that's on the inside and say, no longer, this is not your ground, and you do not have the right to stay here, and I am acknowledging it by telling somebody else that I know that you're here, and it's time for you to go. And if you want victory in your life, and you are holding on to sin, it will not go away, and you will be stuck until it's dealt with. And I say that to you with absolute love and a pleading. Deal with it. Trust that God's grace is sufficient and it's enough. And wives, if it's something that you need to admit to your husband that you think is going to shatter his life, God's grace is sufficient. Husbands, if it's something you need to ask your wife for forgiveness for, God's grace is sufficient. He will be faithful to His Word. Because if He isn't, He's not worthy of our worship. And He will. And I believe that Seven Lakes Baptist Church is being held back from being what God intends for it to be because we as individuals, myself included, have not been serious about sin that easily ensnares us and that we don't deal with properly. And I'm telling you this morning, this morning, that there's somebody in here that I believe that God wants to set free, but He's not going to do it unless you let Him. And the only way that you're going to let Him is to acknowledge there's a fortress in my life that needs to go away. So I'm pleading with you as we go into this time of closing, be real. Even, listen, you might not know how to confess it properly. And that's okay. And that's what mature believers in the church are for. That's what pastors are for, is to come and meet. I, I got this thing going on. I don't know who, who I'm supposed to talk to about it. But it's real, and I'm sick and tired of losing because the enemy comes at me and they deceive me into this thing that produces death and then they stand over me in my failure and accuse me of how horrible I am and it's the same voice that sucked me into this. And I'm sick and tired of it. And I want free from it. And, I, and, and in your freedom, God will begin to use you in ways that He could not use you before. So I challenge you this morning. We've been praying for this service for you guys this morning that if there are things that you're holding on to, let's get rid of them. Get rid of them right now in front of other people. And you're the only person, you're the only person that can make that choice. Listen, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask our pastors to come forward with their wives and just pray. We're just going to pray over the church. I'm going to ask elders, if you're an elder or a former elder, I want you to come with your wife and just pray for our church, lift up the church. We're just praying that God's going to break these strongholds because any stronghold that we've allowed is wrong and we've got to get it torn down and satan hates when we pray so you guys go ahead up and uh and wives if you'll come up but we just want to pray for our church and um i'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes taylor's going to play softly for us and uh and the invitation is really simple you know what your life you know what sin is in your life and you know what sin and maybe you just need to come and pray for others but we want, we want to see God do something incredible through Seven Lakes Baptist Church. He won't do it if we allow these strongholds to stay in our lives. I'm gonna, let's stand for prayer, and then we'll have an invitation, and I, I pray that you'll come. Father, I don't know what you're dealing with people's hearts about, Lord, but I know what you dealt with us about, Lord, as we've prepared, Lord, and we've seen Satan fight this so much, tooth and nail, every step of the way. But God, he's not the victor you are. And Lord, through Jesus Christ, we can have forgiveness and freedom. God, freedom that is so incredible, Lord. But I pray, God, that today, Lord, we have this invitation, Lord, that you'll deal with our hearts. 
God, deal with our church, Lord, and I pray, God, that we will see you accomplish great things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.